<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Eggs. This week, we're featuring Eggs Show alumni, the incredible Ian Foster. Ian made his first Egg Show appearance on December 20th, 2018, shortly after completing his time on Discovery Channel's hit series, Bering Sea Gold. Since that time, Ian's journey took a turn for the entrepreneurial. While finishing his master's internship as a social work counselor when COVID-19 hit, he and his fellow interns transitioned quickly to remote counseling using video conferencing technology. But it wasn't long before they discovered that the quality of the relationships they'd built with their patients was beginning to suffer. Ian stumbled upon the simple fact that screen edge cameras commonly used today create what's called a focal dilemma. A major part of interpersonal communication relies on making and sustaining eye contact, but nearly every webcam that's built in today makes that very challenging. That insight birthed CenterCam, a webcam that hangs to the center of your screen, allowing you to look right into the eyes of the person you're talking with online. It was a simple fix to an important problem. Joining us today to talk about his exciting new invention, the challenges he's had to overcome in producing a technology-driven product amidst a global pandemic, and how he managed to raise more than $2.2 million for his idea by crowdsourcing it on Indiegogo. Please join us in welcoming back to the show, our friend, Ian Foster. Hey, Ian, how are you, man? I'm good. That was a great introduction. I should get you on board on my, my marketing team. Yeah, no. It's funny, sure. like I had to... I, I, when, when you're first starting off in a project, you know, you're doing everything, you're wearing all the hats, you know, I'm the janitor, I'm the marketer, I'm the engineer, I'm the customer support. I mean, that's how these things start when you don't have a bunch of funding behind you. And so I was also writing my profile, like Ian Foster, and it's weird to write about yourself in the third person. And it felt like I was back to my single days writing like profiles for Tinder or something. <laughs> hey, he's really passionate about his, you know, <laughs> you know, that was a great introduction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I totally understand that. I've been uh, putting in some resumes. I had a, a company that was interested in maybe hiring me away from my business and they uh, asked for a resume and I was like, well, I haven't written a resume in 20 years. Like, I mean, I have no idea <laughs> how to write a resume these days. And yeah. so, uh, so I can relate to that experience just in having to put together, you know, like a, a cover letter and sit and, you know, try and create all these accolades for myself, you know, stuff that I don't think is all that important day to day. But, uh, you know, for these guys that, you know, they're trying to make, you know, a, a justification for hiring somebody like me. So they're, they're busy, you know, looking for what awards have you won and what kinds of things. And for me, that all just sounds like bloviating and horn tooting and it sounds gross. And so and then talking about myself in the third person, of course, is weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the nature of the game and we play it as best yeah. we can. Right. Well, um, so a lot has kind of gone on since the last time you were on the show. And uh, since that time, uh, A, you've gotten married, you have a kid, yeah. you've, you've got sheetrock up in your house. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> if, if anyone doesn't know where he's sitting right now is in the cabin in Nome, and he's got internet there. I mean, like, come on, man. <laughs> As yeah, say, and there was a big conflict. So, I mean, I, I spent the last... You know, I came up here in 2009 and then all of a sudden it became a quarter of my life. You know, it's weird how time flies. But when I came up here to Alaska, I, was, I came up here just to, um, you know, do a summer as a gold diver. And and I loved the town and I went broke that first summer. Um, I didn't I didn't get a lot of gold out of it, but I loved the town. So I stuck around. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's 14 years later. But somewhere along there, you um, I, I acquired a big stack of two by fours and a big pile of two inch foam board. And I was like, Hey, I should just put a cabin together. And then all of a sudden it became a proper house somewhere in there. And then, <laughs> then I got drywall and it's a testament to like scrounging and resourcefulness. But now, you know, times have changed a lot. I wasn't, um, I really love the, I, the fact I live about five miles outside of Nome and Nome is 500 air miles from Anchorage, but you can't actually drive there. So uh, you have to fly there. It's very remote. Um, it's it's kind of this own island community. Um, it's not an island, but meaning it's not connected to any road system. And and so I, I live five miles outside or about 10 miles outside of the actual city. So I don't have cell reception out here. And uh, I didn't have electricity up until the last summer. Um, I still don't have a bathroom, so which is what we call a dry cabin. 
<laughs> anyway, so it's, uh, but I, I mean, I, I moved to a, I lived in a tent my first summer in Nome. So my standards are pretty low. So I can, you know, if it's hard walled, I, you know, that's like classy, but yeah, getting internet was kind of a weird situation. I mean, we've, we've been doing some really cool stuff with center cam. Um, it's growing, it's resonating with people, you know, we've shipped, about 19,000 cameras now, which is a wow. big number. It's weird to say that out loud. Yeah. And um, so that being said, uh, like I have to be connected. I spent a lot of time in transit, a lot of time, um, you know, it, you know, work until one, two in the morning at a friend's house with internet connection where I was renting an office um, last summer. And so this summer I was like, yeah, let's pull the trigger. So I've got internet out here. And it's crazy. Like, it's really good. This is a better connection than I had in town. The internet connection that I have out in my remote cabin. It's really weird. That's awesome. More importantly, I just had a kid and I mean, I would pay so much more. Don't tell, don't tell, tell Alaska who I'm paying for internet (laughs) about that, (laughs) but um, I'm able to FaceTime with my little baby and from my cabin. And it's so amazing just to be able to check in for my wife to call and say, hey, listen to the babble happening, you know, and I can hear my little baby babbling. And um, I was just up. I've been here for about a month with a week break and I'm here for another week and then I go back. So I'm back and forth all summer. So it's really awesome to not mix miss those moments, you know. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's really cool. Well, and I was going to say, you know, the real danger in you having internet up there is that inspires a guy like Mike who uh, fell in love with Gnome <laughs> also last summer and, uh, you know, is looking for remote opportunities as web developer that he might be able to facilitate from Alaska. So, so I oh think that, gosh. That you actually happened. proving that it can happen is dangerous for us because that means Mikey might be out of here. I actually, um, I'm, I'm really looking at Anchorage for winter this year, so. That's awesome. It, it might happen. Yeah, but, it was yeah. a little more connected in Anchorage, but you know, if it can happen in Nome, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, that's true. Which is kind of scary. I mean, I was I was a little bit ethically, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it wasn't an easy decision for me to get internet in my cabin. And I know it's, nowadays everybody wants internet, but for me, some of the magic of this cabin specifically, it's quiet, it's remote. You walk out on my back deck, you see nothing but a wild Alaska River Valley. And I love that part of it. And and, so getting into the internet yeah. was kind of like, I like the idea of being disconnected. <laughs> I'm sorry, what'd you say, Mike? I said, and Zeke's yurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. If you look that way, you get wild Alaska. If you look that way, you get, you know, my minor friends that have all of their minor crap in their backyards, just like me. So. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, Ian, maybe let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about Center Cam. So obviously we we teed it off in the intro, but I wonder if you talk just a little bit more about sort of the early days of the process. You know, what was the problem you uncovered, uh, which I think is something that you know, especially people who are working remotely and stuff, will be able to you know connect with immediately. But then also just sort of start the process of how you went from I guess idea or something written on a napkin into something uh, real. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm gl- glad you mentioned napkins. There have been napkins involved at various <laughs> stages of this process. That's not just a meta- or like an, a metaphor. Like, it's real. Like Napkins work just as good as paper and computers sometimes when you're trying to jot it down. Uh, well, it all started here in Alaska. You know, I, I developed a, a really weird skill set that I, for a long time, I didn't know what it was. You know, gold diving requires you to, you know, fix machinery and, you know, most of us build our own equipment. So I just, I gathered all these like really weird skills that I thought were old fashioned and um, they came all into play once I got to the napkin stage of development. But so uh, I've always wanted to become a therapist as well. When I was a teenager, um, I had to come apart and I had some really good people help me out. And so eventually I, I wanted to go back to becoming a therapist. Um, the problem is uh, a lot of times, especially initially, um, it's a it's a long process financially. You don't make a lot of money initially as a therapist. And um, I also wanted to do some adventuring. It also requires you to, um, you know, be in one place for a, a long period of time. So um, I, I finally was in the position to circle back, um, you know, as a 40 year old. <laughs> and I was finishing my degree uh, when the pandemic hit. And you know, I don't want to like cause any anxiety in people, but you know, if you, if you rewind the clock, you look at the early stages, we're getting reports from Italy. We're getting reports from, you know, EU, from China about lockdowns, about, 
you know, people, hospitals running out of room, stuff like that. So I'm reading these reports and I'm watching it show up in America. And um, all of a sudden, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty at that time. Our schools, uh, master, or their social work schools shut down their, their uh, internships just from a risk standpoint. I was doing one at a residential treatment center uh, and I was working with youth uh, as a substance use counselor. So I'm going into these uh, tr- this treatment center and um, I'm you know having these great meetings with these kids. March means that I've been working with them for a few months and they're starting to do the work. And then all of a sudden I can't go and meet them in person. And so we had we built relationships. We had started to do the work. They knew me. I knew them. We knew what to expect. That's that's when the work starts in a therapeutic relationship. And all of a sudden I can't meet with them in person. So um, we switched to remote. And uh, I donated a smartphone to the school and we made it a dumb phone. We basically, it, it was, it only ran Zoom. That's the only thing that smartphone could do is run <laughs> Zoom. And so, uh, so I'm putting a phone in the hands of some kids that had tech addictions <laughs> and, and they're just looking at it because they haven't had a phone in their hand for months. And, you know, it's, it's back to like, you know, that land for them, but Anyway, so but they're looking all over the place and I'm looking all over the Zoom screen. I'd been a lot of Zoom conferences, but with there were multi-people conferences. They weren't like one-on-one trying to, you know, facilitate, you know, therapeutic environment and it which is different and tricky anyway. And um anyway, it, the it fizzled so fast. It was really startling. Um we had bad internet connection. We didn't know where to look and I mean, I think I, I had a, I had a a couple of kids were just showing up because I think they it was just a break from school or something. But um, a couple of the kids we had a really good relationship with. And even those kids after about they they tolerated it for like three visits. And it's like we both just decided this isn't really working. So and that's where it ended. And it sucked. And um, the the paradigm, another thing paradigm that I've tried to adopt is isn't just looking at the problem and complaining. It's it's looking at, well, what can make this problem better? And I've been doing that for years. And so I applied that to here because when you look at the pandemic and the overwhelm that we all felt during that time and all the things that are out of our control, like governmental policy, CDC, you know, locked borders, all that stuff, that's way beyond all of our pay grades. Like we couldn't do anything about that. So you you go down the list of, well, what can I control? And, and I got to the question, well, what could make this video conferencing suck less? And I started imagineering that, you know, it was, it didn't involve a napkin yet, but uh, I was just thinking, well, what if the focal angle changed? And, uh, you know, what if the camera was in the middle of the screen, which, I mean, to me, that was a new idea. I've since, um, you know, been in contact with a lot of the people that have been in the development of middle screen webcams and such. And, um, I'm not the first person to have the idea. There have been other teams working on it. Um, but the timing, I hit the timing right. And my application, what the way I did it with the clip, that was unique, top-down orientation. There are a lot of things that um, CenterCam did differently than some of the other people that were working on it. But frankly, the timing was just great. Everybody switched to remote all of a sudden, and then everybody was confronted with the same problem I was. Like, why does Center, or why do... You know, why does video video conferencing suck? Like, yeah. why, why do you have to? And then we've all become actors too. You know, we have to look away from the person we're actually talking to on a video conference, look up into the lens, because that's how you give a good presence and good eye contact. And it's ironic that that actually like gets you away from the connection you want to have with people. And, yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. You know, I think one of the things that I really like about your approach too is it, so just speaking of good timing. So just months before in January of, of 2020, I guess, right before everything started shutting down, I launched a remote work consultancy. And so, and it just, you know, by random happenstance, just good timing. I had already yeah. put together a, a podcast and some other stuff on the topic. And so it seemed like a thing to do. So I started pursuing that. And one of the things that we discovered was the same thing early on. And one of the things that I think is interesting is that so many people's approach to it was a software solution, right? How can we make this more fun? How can we make this more entertaining? How can we do more with the platform? But what I like that you did that's different is that you actually 
built a piece of hardware that made <laughs> made the situation different, right? Because I mean, it, it wasn't an idea or, you know, it's not a problem of making a Zoom call more fun. It's really a problem of making a Zoom call more human, I guess. And, uh, you know, I, I've always used this metaphor, this idea of different mo- uh, modes of ch- uh, conversation uh, and like how, how good they are for you. Like if you were to think of communication in the uh, the form of being satiated from like a glass of water or something right and maybe an email or a text is really low on that list right it's like a an eighth of a glass of water you know so it's communication but it's not very satiating you know yeah. all the way up to video call which is pretty darn good you know maybe it's 80 or 90 percent but it's like you know you're still only half satiated you know and then at the end of the day the the real connection is real life and so bridging that gap between real life and virtual communication, I think, is is critical as you stumbled upon. But like I say, I love your your hardware approach versus just trying to, you know, crack the software code. Yeah, crack it and just add a filter on me that looks like a cat. And then well, that, that made all the difference. Yeah. I mean, I'm not lying. <laughs> well, um, some people it might be an improvement and some, <laughs> some some of the things that come out of my mouth, I'm like, I might as well be a cat right now. What am I talking about? <laughs> Um, Yeah, uh, you know, well, the software approach, I mean, we've gone through a lot of different ideas. I'm a creative guy. And so we, we, you know, we think of a lot of different ways to solve problems. And there are plenty of ways that Zoom and video conference software could be improved. Um, You know, I don't know if you know this. I mean, iPhone and um, the iPad, they have AI auto eye gaze correction. So um, when you're looking at your iPhone on a FaceTime call and you're looking at the person on the screen, they're actually auto-correcting your pupils or oh, really? your irises. So okay. it actually makes it look like, you know, you're looking at the person, which so that means that they're actually kind of digitally just kind of moving your irises. So that's available right now. Windows uh, or Microsoft has a, a a new computer that does that as well. From a computational standpoint, it requires a lot of um, computing power to be able to do that. So there's only the newer computers can do that. Um, And so it's going to be interesting to see what the dynamic is. I haven't used it. I mean, I've used the iPhone um, eye gaze correction. Um, Some of it's good. Some of it's kooky. It's kind of weird. It doesn't really look natural. So um, it's going to be see it's going to be interesting. So we're taking a hardware approach and some big tech is taking a software approach and um, we'll see where the, where the dust settles. Yeah. Um, I mean, our, so, our strategy, sorry, sorry to interrupt Mike. Oh, you're fine. Yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. Of a delay. Our strategy was to do what we can. And I don't have the, I didn't have the funding to take a software approach. I mean, I know the guy that sold the patent to Microsoft for eye gaze correction and he sold that patent back in like 2006. So to give you an idea of the resources that have been coming to bear on that problem, I mean, Microsoft 2006, 2022, we're just seeing it. Like I don't have that kind of budget to develop that kind of software and go with that approach. But I could find you know a small USB enabled camera and tweak it and improve it. So that's what I could do. That's what we did. Uh, that that's what I was gonna uh, just ask. Is you're obviously using the camera right now. Do yeah. you by chance have another one sitting by you where you could show it? Uh, yeah. I, let me. Yes. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, while he goes and looks for one, maybe uh, we'll just talk a little bit about that because I think you know. I mean, what I what I think is so interesting or or cool about his product is basically it's the simplicity of the thing. Right. I mean, it's not an overly complex device. You know, it's basically a, you know, a clip attached to a webcam. And like, like we sort of alluded to at the top, it's a it's a simple solution, but it's a very important problem. And so uh, so I really like the uh, the approach and, and just sort of the simplicity of installation. Yeah. And thanks for using our tagline. It's it's funny. I've uh, I did a lot of the video editing of myself and I, I come from media back in the day. I did a lot of uh, video and editing of people and. I mean, even if it's your friends, uh, you know, as a subject of editing, uh, you know, when you when your friend doesn't say something like quite right, you you know, you start just like kind of cursing at the person because you you end up looking at the same frame 20 times, you know, so it it doesn't change when I'm editing myself in a video timeline. I like (laughs) I get really frustrated with myself. Why did you pause? Why did you breathe? All that stuff. 
but um, center cam, a better connection, uh, an, an important uh, or a, a simple solution to a port, an important problem. I make fun of myself constantly with that tagline. So like when there's something stupid that happens, like, hey, we're hungry. Let's go to the restaurant. Ooh, a simple solution to an important problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like a family. Well, I, I have they a, all make fun of that line. Yeah, I have a, a much grosser example of that. I, I once did a, a book design or I laid out a book called A Clean Break. And every time you leave the bathroom, you know, and it's relatively easy, you know, we go, oh, it's a clean break, you know, so anyway, <laughs> a little bit grosser, but it's the same idea. So, but what's really funny about your, uh, your tagline is that actually, I didn't know that was the tagline. It's just exactly oh, wow. it came into my head. Now, maybe you've beat you, maybe you got me with marketing, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so may, maybe it is your line and you've just, well, this know, is you implanted it. All of a sudden. But, but what I love is, you know, I think for people who, who do put a value on human relationship and who do put a value on, you know, bettering the experience of communication between people, I think, you know, it, maybe it's so natural. It just comes right off the tongue. Yeah. 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 That's the, that's the kind of the summary of our marketing video that we've had. A simple solution to an important problem. And I'm making fun of myself right there. Cause I was <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. So here's the assembly and uh, let's see if, hold on. I might be able to get some light on the subject. We just got, so now we're into injection molding. We're building everything from scratch. Now at first we were partnering with our manufacturer on a number of different products and um, just kind of trying to piggyback, trying to simplify some of the manufacturing and, and speed up the timelines of what we could, you know, bring to bear. Um, we just got these. These are injection molded ring lights and um, three color. Uh, uh. Uh-huh. Anyway, um, I'm going to use these as kind of a flashlight to shine some light on the actual. Uh, let's see if this works. <laughs> might be kind of ghetto. Oh, there we go. Does that make that easier to see or? <laughs> No, I think it's, I think it's okay. Right. I mean, I can see it on my end anyway. All so right. Hopefully. Anyway, so this is the new one. So uh, it's really simple. It's, it's one foot of flex tube, um, USB enabled camera on the end, five feet of USB cord. Um, it's a pretty simple spring clip. And depending on your use scenario, there's, you know, a, we call these on the, on the clip itself, there's a thing called a U hook. And that's what the flex tube clicks into. You can hear it click. And um, this allows you to adjust it um, simply up, down, side to side. Um, normal webcam clips, uh, like you have on pretty much 98% of webcams, they, they're kind of a passive clamp. They don't actually click and play, you know, like clamp in place with, with tension. And so we wanted it to be one hand operable just to move it side to side. Um, and then we've gotten into the reason I wanted to show you the camera body. I mean, it's pretty simple, but. We have a bunch of fins on it that I don't know that you can see very well. You can kind of see mm-hmm. the profile right there. Yeah, I see that. You can kind of see the fins right there. Um, that's passive heat sink. And um, we're design and utility patenting that all around the world. I paid a bunch of money to patent lawyers. That allowed us to decrease the operating temp of our product by 10 degrees, which is a fun engineering problem. So we're getting into like, thermal conducted plastics and stuff it's that's it's awesome. really cool which is like cutting edge in the plastics industry and it's just kind of a nerdy thing that's really interesting to me well and there's probably something to that in that i, I imagine if the camera was sitting in the center of your screen and it was you know working too hard and getting too hot you know maybe you have several meetings back to back uh i imagine you could damage a screen with heat or something like that so it's probably a, a wise thing to be to be looking at yeah. well I, yeah and i we it wasn't um our our, our cameras wouldn't work properly before they would actually damage the screen. But um, yeah, to your point, you don't want things operating that hot. And so um, that was part of the reason for that is the chips were just hot boxed inside of um, the camera body. So um, well, maybe- we've, been, we've been taking kind of the, the ready fire aim approach. You well, know, I, kind of I wonder if we can maybe get into fire. that a little bit, because I, I think that that's what's you know, especially for young entrepreneurs, people are just getting started on a business, or maybe they're going to build a product, something like what you're doing. I think that there's this onus because you see all these things out, you know, in the market that are so incredible nowadays. I think there's this idea that you need to be perfect or that the idea needs to be fully baked or whatever. And so a lot of people just don't start, right? It seems overwhelming to get to a certain level of doneness. 
So they just don't get going. And so, you know, we talked earlier about napkins and things like that coming in, but I wonder if you talk about sort of just the early days of the process and like maybe what came first, you know, uh, chicken or the egg or raising money or, you know, doing things on your own. Like how did, how did the actual process of, I guess, bootstrapping this thing together get started? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I had a pretty clear idea in my mind. So at this point, I've imagined a lot of different projects. I mean, my cabin that I'm I'm living in right now, it was, you know, an imagine imaginational project for a while. And then, you know, I used napkins and scraps of paper to kind of imagine it, you know, visually. Um, but now I have a pretty good process just in my mind. So I kind of understood generally what I needed. Um, and then it was just a process of jumping in and trying stuff. So um, when we launched the Kickstarter, we had developed a product over about the, about eight months and, um, they went through a lot of different, um, iterations, but even when I launched the Kickstarter, we had a functional model, but I wasn't satisfied with it, but that was enough to prove the idea. The agreement that you make in Kickstarter is that this is the idea and we're going to finish it. Um, some people, there are a lot of bigger companies now that are using Kickstarter as a marketing tool, not as an innovation and idea proving tool. The numbers are, uh, are a little bit better on Kickstarter than Indiegogo, but typically, you know, 20% of campaigns actually send out a product. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, ideas that don't act, that get funded that actually don't ever get to a, a person. Huh. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons I've had some friends that have had situations like that, where they've in good faith, they've started a crowdfund campaign and they haven't, um, been able to ship product just because of internal, external stuff. And, you know, it kind of sucks, but that's the reason that's part of the excitement of going to crowdfunding sites. Anyway, long story short, we had a pretty decent, uh, prototype when we started the Kickstarter. I actually, uh, we were actually, I was that? there when you, I was there when you got the prototype. The first one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I'm in Gnome and I get the first, you know, some of the first prototypes. Uh, yeah, you were there for the first FlexTube prototype. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had already gotten just a USB enabled camera on a dongly USB cord. And then it, it be so duct tape and uh, uh, zip ties. That's what I used for the first FlexTube for just to put it in the middle of the screen. And, uh, Anyway, I, anyway, to summarize, I mean, I can go, this has been a three-year process for me. So let me just summarize that um, jump in with what you have. Doesn't matter how cheap or crappy it is. You don't have to go public with it, um, but just jump in and see if it sucks or if it's, you're on the right track and then take that, you know, prototype and go to the next step and, and then draw and, and consistent. I consistently ask myself the question, um, how could this be better? And what's the simplest way to make it better? And, um, I would go to that because everybody that looks at it, they're like, oh, that's really simple. And I'm like, yeah, it was really complicated to get to simplicity, but yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. That's what we try to do from a design standpoint. I, I have a lot of examples in my life of people that overcomplicate simple things and, um, working with discovery was that like, you know, sometimes the real life story was better than the narrative, but, you know, certain creative people, they have to put their stamp on it. So they actually change real to unreal. And then that was what aired on the show. And um, so I have a, a pretty extreme aversion to like changing things unnecessarily. I, I really like things to be simple. Well, I wonder if, uh, and maybe this will require you putting on your, uh, your therapist hat. But um, so one of the things that, you know, I, I'm taking from what you're saying is basically, you know, you were able to supersede, I guess, sort of a fear of trying, right? I think that this is what keeps people from doing things. They feel they don't have the, the knowledge, they don't have the skills, they don't have whatever, and they're not willing to put themselves at risk, right? They're not going to put themselves out there, even if the risk is very low, really, you know, like, okay, I'm not an engineer, but I could still draw it on a piece of paper, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so maybe the risk is low, but for whatever reason, that's a bridge too far for some people, right? Everybody's got a different tolerance. And so you, I mean, obviously you, you came from a media background. I mean, you're, you're mining for gold in Alaska. Like, I mean, there's certainly a, a risk tolerance there. That's probably a little higher than most, 
um, you know, you might be more willing to try. Uh, as you mentioned before, you've got, you know, sort of your, your mining friends and things like that who are, are building their own equipment and stuff like that. I mean, there's already kind of an innovative group who are, you know, I guess confident in their, their ability to create something with their own hands. So you seem to already have, you know, maybe unbeknownst to you, you, you built a series of skills that really lend you to do this kind of project. I wonder if as a therapist, or if you were trying to give advice to somebody who maybe is struggling with the fear of getting started and that stuff. And I think you started to get into this a little bit, but like, do you have advice for people that might help them overcome that fear of trying? Like, Hey, where, where might they find a baby step to try something to sort of, I guess, improve their tolerance as it pertains to risk? Yeah. Well, uh, the answer I think is partly, you know, in your question, <clears throat> um, baby step is just that it's a baby step and it's, it's a 1% approach, 1% better approach. It's starting where you're at approach. It's an, it's a one inch approach. It's a one minute approach. Um, I, I recently read a book and I'm rereading. It's an excellent book. It's about, um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and it's called feeling good. It's about, um, you know, the process of, uh, the therapeutic environment for overcoming depression, basically. And um, that's basically what it talks about. I mean, when you condense it down, it's, it's um, try to do something for a minute, try to do something more than you're already doing that doesn't scare you. And especially when we're talking about product innovation um, or even making improvements in your life, like it's not that hard to make an improvement in your life, um, but you do have to start somewhere. And I think a lot of people think that they discount um, they become their own worst enemy by discounting the fact that if you work out for 30 seconds today and you didn't yesterday and you didn't the day before and you don't have a habit of it, 30 seconds is better than zero. And people are like, well, 30 seconds doesn't matter. And it's like, stop talking to yourself like that. Like 30 seconds is huge. If you don't do it, if that's not you, if it's not normal or easy for you, 30 seconds is huge. And so a lot of people get in their own way. Um, the whole process for me was terrifying. Like right now I have a, a decent story of, you know, where it's gone and everything. And, but I remember, you know, forming the Kickstarter. I didn't know. I, I mean, we ate a lot of crap online because people are like, this is ridiculous. You know, people said some nasty things and that was the nice way of saying that. <laughs> like, like my favorite troll comment that we've gotten is, Hey, this product is great, period, for me to poop on. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, we've, we've dealt with some adversity. Um, and, you know, it, it didn't just happen. Like, I remember my days on Discovery just feeling so self conscious. And I, I didn't even watch the whole series, I watched some of it. And I was just so self conscious about the things that I would say. I mean, my voice cracked sometimes. They're just like, you know, anyway, it, it was really, a lot of it was really embarrassing, very, very difficult for me, but that built muscles. And so when you rewind the clock to your question, like, well, I was 1% better. I, I didn't stop. And I also had the benefit of a lot of the things that I'll call failures in my life. And what I realized was that most of those failures, the common thread between the failures was that I just didn't stop. They weren't bad ideas. I just quit them. And that's different than doing something you shouldn't be doing or doing something stupidly or whatever. Um, and most of the time, and you'll find this, like I've, I've read some war memoirs and General Patton. I mean, a lot of times he said that, you know, a lot of times a bad plan executed vigorously will win over a good plan executed timidly. And so when you, you process what that actually means in our lives, like there's, there's a tremendous amount of room for error and still experience, you know, what we call success. But when you quit, when you stop, when you start saying mean crap to yourself that your friends wouldn't even say to you, that's stuff that you got to get under, under control. And I've had plenty of that stuff and I've had plenty of time. To, <laughs> I've said some mean things to myself. I've had, I've had to work on that. I've had to change my relationship with myself to get here. But yeah, the original question, 1% better, you know, start where you are. Don't discount the fact that if you're doing something today that you didn't do yesterday, that's a win and celebrate it yep. and give yourself credit for it. 
Yeah, I think that's a great insight. And I think too, just to, I mean, I guess sort of add to it or even add, you know, just one more layer to it is I, I, I think you're right. You know, it's obviously just baby steps, you know, do these little approaches. But I think that the one part too that needs to be just sort of said and at risk of, you know, trademark infringement or whatever is that you have to just do it also. Like, I mean, you know, somebody actually has to, you know, you have to get that nudge. So even if it is just for that 30 seconds, like, you know, you've got to find it in yourself to actually do that. And, uh, and so I think that, you know, being able to, I, I mean, I think, you know, and I appreciate your candidness or sort of opening up like that, but I think, you know, that relationship with self is what sort of gets in the way, you know, most of the time. So I, I think that's really good advice. Well, and if you, I mean, look at center cam, look at uh, your cabin, look at your dredge, look at, you know, the, the house here that I'm at that, you know, started as a, you know, a crappy yard. Now it's got the big rock wall with the flagstone patio and, you know, I'm finishing up the backyard finally. And it's, it's one of those things that you just, you start with one thing, you, you spend a few hours on it. If you can't finish it in a day, spend a few more hours on it the next day, spend a few more hours on it here, or there, before you know it, you got a house with sheetrock on the walls. You know, it's uh, great. <laughs> and yeah, just to, just to sort of add to that too. I mean, you know, we've, we've interviewed some 260 people on the show at this point, you know, CEOs and startup founders and all these people, and all of them have a story like this, where it's, you know, they had to overcome some kind of adversity. They end up doing the work, then they make something successful happen. And then everybody asked them how they did it so quickly and how did it happen overnight? Meanwhile, it was 10, 10 years later or whatever. Right. And so the, I guess the value of relationship with self versus the perception of others, you know, is, is a cr you know critical component of this, right? Because for the people who are on the outside, who are just doing their thing day to day or week to week, and, and they're not paying that much attention to you, you know, you might come out looking like somebody who had this overnight success, like, my God, you know, you, you got center cam out, look how, you know, polished it is and you're ready and you're in business. And, you know, how did that happen? You know, and they're looking for a a quick answer. Right. But the, the reality is there isn't a quick answer. Like this took time and we did build and it, you know, we did stumble and we did fall and we did pick ourselves back up, you know, and I think all those pieces are really important to hear from people who have found whatever we call success these days. And uh, you know, and so I appreciate you, you know, being open with that stuff. Yeah. Well uh, I think one of the reasons uh, center cam is resonating with people is, I mean, the story is real. I mean, it's funny, like I'm, I'm dealing with, um, or it's not dealing with, I'm working with public relations people and, and really capable marketers now. So I'm outsourcing a lot of that initial stuff that I was handling. And all of them say, wow, your story is great. We love your story. And the thing about a story, we all love stories, you know, but the, the story was real. Like that, that happened to me, like, all of the impetus and the emotion of center cam, it, it was, it happened. It wasn't like I created some weird story just for the purpose of marketing. Like that was the story. And then center cam came from it. And um, I think we kind of lose track sometimes of, you know, our, our reasons and motivations for things, but, you know, I guess to the, to the bigger point um, it's tough when you're in front of a lot of people to make these kinds of adjustments and, you know, five years ago, three years ago, even, I guess two years ago, well, three or four or whatever, I don't know that I would have had the emotional resilience to be able to handle some of the criticisms we've had, some of the, the problems we've had. Um, and, you know, emotional muscles are just like regular muscles. The more you get into the gym and, and test yourself, you know, the stronger you get and the more used to, you know, the adversity of big weights, you know, <laughs> and, and emotional muscles are the same way. And, um, I dealt with a tremendous amount of adversity and I felt like uh, I was really behind the curve for my age, for what I needed to be doing. Um, I had a good sense of what my skill set was and um, I felt like it hadn't been properly deployed yet. That was really concerning to me. It was really frustrating to me that I kept on finding these dead ends in life. So I was, I, you know, I'm pretty driven. And um, so center cam is kind of like, you know, it's, it's kind of a, the product of all of that um, drive and frustration, you know, but um, I had to do a lot of work to get to the point where I can adjust in real time to some of the, you know, problems that we face with what well, we're doing, uh, you know, international launches and stuff like that. There's a lot going on. Yeah. I, I actually, that's kind of where my next question was going to be is 
So you got the product, you got a, a viable product, you got the Indiegogo now taking off and you've got all these orders. How stressful is that to say, hey, I've got this. Now I've got to get 10,000 of these things out in the next year. And they're coming from China and we're having a, a, a big a you trade, know, war, trade, yeah. trade war going on. Yeah. How did that all come out? How, I'm sure that was a nightmare. Yeah, so we we got a, a prototype early on. I mean, I was I, I got the first camera back in like like May, May of 2020. And then we're we're improving it, improving it. And then we get to January. We have a good enough product to launch on the Kickstarter. We're still making some micro adjustments, you know, the clip, et cetera. <clears throat> And so, but I, I pre-order a bunch of that initial camera that we green lit and, uh, you know, in, in, so I had, I think like 400 in January and my Kickstarter goal is like $10,000, you know, it wasn't much. I could do all of that. That was all well within my control and, and ability to do that. And so all of a sudden the Kickstarter takes off and, uh, we raised $63,000 on Kickstarter. And that was when I knew like, Oh wow, this is a thing. Like this isn't just me with my napkin. Like, like this is resonating with people, and people are are realizing this is a thing. So, um, the problem with that is I I had 400 units in my hands, and we had 600 backers on Kickstarter, and so I have to order 200 units to be able to fulfill to the rest of the Kickstarter backers. And um, so we we transferred over to Indiegogo. Indiegogo has a has a camp has a platform called in demand that allows um, crowdfund platforms to continue to raise funds in between the end of the crowdfund and when they actually get their product. So we just transferred over to Indiegogo. That's how that happened um, to continue that process um, while we were getting more cameras. Cause at that point we were like, well, we've, we've got cameras, we have the finished product. We can just start to ship these things. And, um, and then our manufacturer kind of went, uh, radio silent for a minute and um, they're like yeah everything's fine and then all of a sudden like usually we'd gotten product in you know a month's time when we ordered it but we're going on to two months and they finally tell us like hey we apologize we actually can't get the old chip that we've been getting for this camera and so we're having to buy it we're having to find a new chip and then we're going to have to you know make sure it works to our specs so this is uh, like April now I've been crowdfunding on Indiegogo for like two months telling people, yeah, it's on the way or soon anyway. And all of a sudden I have to pivot really hard. <clears throat> and like, I, I know what my intentions are and what my integrity is. And it's not like we had a bunch of expenses. We were all working remote. So we didn't have like office expenses and stuff like that. We had a bunch of money, but we didn't, we couldn't spend it. <laughs> like we couldn't buy product. And my integrity has never been so far so precarious as when I was messaging our backers about what the status of this endeavor was. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, I, I couldn't go to China. China's borders were closed down. I would normally just get over there and, you know, physically see and experience that firsthand. But I'm having to go through English second language manufacturers and to try to figure out what the actual status is. We tried to find other chips. Chip now we're actually building 2.0, so we're dealing directly with a chip manufacturer. But that process, I mean, it's a six-month year process, and the quantities, you know, they don't even want to talk to you unless you're like talking 50, 100,000 units. So there's no way I could do my usual like bull in a china shop, find a solution, you know, <laughs> to this. Like <laughs> I just had to wait and I had to message as best I could and about what was happening and let people know, hey, we're we're waiting for a good product that we can green light. There's a, there's a, yeah, so the chipset shortage, when people are reading about that, that affected us, that affected our whole endeavor, you know, because it's chip based. So we had to switch to a different chip. Finally got those models in like September. We've been crowdfunding and it's been taking off. I mean, Indiegogo hit hard. So we've been crowdfunding for like six months, I think, on Indiegogo before we were actually able to ship. So and that wasn't the original deal. And that was that was where my integrity was kind of, you know, precarious because I had told people one thing and then things had to pivot. 
And I was, you know, honest about that. And, but it was very difficult because people were like, wait, what, you know, and, <laughs> and that was understandable, but man, it was, it was stressful. We're, we're finally, and then it takes time to like actually get the product. So um, we we actually finally had the resources to get ahead of the curve. So we're expecting that to happen this week. We have a bunch of cameras in the mail. So, I mean, a year and a half after we started crowdfunding, we're finally able to have extra inventory to begin drop shipping. It's been a tremendously long process for us. Yeah. Like, back, to your, back to your question, Ryan, like that 1%, like I couldn't, if, if I had known the stuff I would have to deal with, I'm not sure that it would have started. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's crazy, but you know, you deal with one problem at a time and you start where you can and you know, there's some days, you know, the last couple of weeks have been pretty crazy for not for center cam reasons, but for other reasons, but still center cam is happening. And, um, and the only way you handle it, you can get overwhelmed or you can just start doing what you can. And that's the only way to decrease some of those anxieties, you know? Yeah. I think there's a little, uh, you know, takeaway right there to this idea, you know, really, you know, you can't control everything, you know, and uh, you talked earlier about, you know, like border closures, things like that. I mean, obviously we have no control over that stuff. So controlling what you can control is a great way to alleviate anxiety, right? Obviously you can't control a global pandemic. You can't control the rate at which a tanker comes across the ocean. You can't, you know, you, you got nothing for any of that stuff, but yeah. you can talk to your people. You can, you know, explain to them what's happening and be honest with them and, you know, stay true to your sort of integrity and everything by, you know, communicating the best you can. And some people will be upset, but most people will probably go with you. And, uh, you know, and so, but I think that being able to, I guess, put yourself in the frame of mind where you're really only focusing on what you can control, I, th I think is something that a lot of people struggle with, especially in kind of a social media world, you know, pretty easy to get caught up in the problems of other people or the wants mm -hmm. or the needs or the, you know, how come he's on vacation and I'm not? And how come, you know, all these kinds of things. And so it's really easy to kind of get out of yourself and into other people's business. And, uh, and so I think it's really important to do that. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you too, and this is maybe kind of a growth question, is something about knowing where you are. So your business is obviously growing. You're finally now getting some inventory and getting out ahead of orders, which has got to be a giant relief after these last couple of years. Um, but, you know, so many, so much like advice for young entrepreneurs, you know, doesn't always get people where they are. And so, and what I mean is, you know, sometimes you've got the billionaire taking millionaire's advice, the millionaire taking, you know, the billionaire's advice, and none of that stuff is applicable to the, you know, startup founder, for example. And I know, and I can sort of say just even in my own situation, uh, I had a little product I was trying to launch sort of pre-pandemic and, uh, and one of the problems or one of the things that got in the way from me is I started trying to solve like drop ship, trying to solve software dilemmas, trying to solve, solve all these problems, right? Before we ever even launched a product or even knew if it was viable. And mm -hmm. so I was way down the road and I was trying to solve the problems of a much bigger organization before, you know, doing the things I need to do. And so I wondered, first of all, if you could talk a little bit about just sort of knowing where you are so that you know what you need to work on. And maybe some of this is what we were talking about before, self-awareness and things like that but also knowing where to go next. Cause I think, you know, okay, we talked earlier about baby steps and now people are in. So in your situation, you started with baby steps, but now you're all in. So what's the next baby step? How do you keep moving forward? Man, that's an excellent question. And I, I can't answer that without talking specifically about what I've been doing in Alaska. I mean, gold diving, uh, building boats. Um, I did repair work for a while. I mean, Mike's seen the kind of work that I've done up here. It's the most okay. physical, grueling, dirty, you want to talk to that, Mike? Like, I was going to say, I've had to do the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't just seen it. So, I mean, I've never been, I ne I've never been uh, hesitant. I've, al I've always wanted to have pride in just doing the work that needed to get done. And I've never shied away from a job just because it's dirty. And most of my work in center cam is fairly clean, but um that being said, I'm not shy about trying something. And that's kind of the, the gist of it is um, I, I learned somewhere in there that you can either sit on the sidelines and hope something good happens, or you can just fumble your way through a dance where you have two left feet and figure out how to dance. And it's, I don't know that many people waltz really good the first time they try it. 
And you just have to go through that. And it's a little bit ugly. I've had the benefit up here in Nome of a lot of my failures and uh, and successes. They they haven't been in a public scene. Um, Bering Sea Gold was kind of the exception to that. I was a rookie cap captain posturing hard, man. Like I pitched Discovery on that show and I told them I'm a gold diver and I didn't even have a boat. So I was working full time for the state. I had pitched you know, discovery. And then all of a sudden I'm in the middle of a negotiation with them and I'm going out into a snow bank, building a, a, a gold diving boat outside. And I mean, it was tremendously energizing. Like I had to pull through, you know, cause I'm not just a talker. And, um, but there's a certain point where you have to, you have to, I don't even know how to say it, it, it cause it's not a posturing. I mean, there's a lot of po- people that posture in the world and they say, I'm doing this when they're not, or th- when they can't. And um, there, there's a lot of people that, you know, they call themselves, whatever, you know, I'm a creator, I'm a model. That's like a famous thing. I'm a model on Instagram. And it's like, well, when's the last time you got paid by a client for modeling? Yeah. And the answer is you're not a model until you're getting paid for it. So there's a certain amount, but that being said, like starting to frame it as if you you are something that's important. And, and just <clears throat> anyway, it, it's really complex. Um, and I've thought a lot about it, but um, you have to be willing to step out and, and publicly declare that you are somewhere a little bit farther than where you're at. And then you have to have the integrity and faith in yourself to bridge that gap. And I don't know how else to do that. And I, I think don't that's think right. That's disingenuous. I think there's like, you know, it, it's the one little nugget that makes the cliche not totally offensive is the fake it till you make it thing. Right. So yeah. because I mean, it's a really simplified yeah, way of saying something more complex, like what you're trying to get to, which is basically, yeah, you. you know, you do have to put yourself out there. Right. And the yeah. only way we grow is by sort of reaching. Right. Like if we, if we're just trying to keep doing what we're doing, we don't grow, but in order to grow, we have to reach and we have to stretch for the, whatever the next thing is. And sometimes that requires maybe floating a little bit or getting a little fluffy or, you know, whatever. But what happens is either you a back it up and then you will have grown. You'll have, you learned the skill you needed to learn. You'll have done the work you needed to do, whatever it is to make that next step. Or you become the guy that everybody goes, oh, well, you know, he's always talking like that. <laughs> he's telling everybody that he's doing this stuff, but, you know, really he's just doing video games all day. He's not really, not, not really an entrepreneur. He just, you know, works for himself because no one will hire him, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So, so I think that's. Thanks, thanks for summarizing that. I was struggling there, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, and that's the, that's the place of progress. The thing that it's done for me, and when I look back, I mean, publicly declaring this Discovery Channel that I was a gold diving captain, even though I didn't have a boat yet. I mean, I actually was a captain in my heart. I knew I would make that happen, and I did. And when you look back at how bold that was, it doesn't feel like it was posturing or anything other than like setting publicly declaring a goal and then bridging the gap. And um, there, the stakes were so high, I could not fail. That first season, I was learning so much and it was so painful because I was in front of, I mean, we had the highest rated uh, premiere of any Discovery show in their history. It was, I think, six million people or something like that. Maybe they beat it since then. But there's a lot of eyes on me and I I knew that that was going to happen and I could not fail. Like there was such good pressure. Well, and I had, I had to meet it. And it was embarrassing, man, because I was making so many stupid mistakes, rookie mistakes. I didn't have a ton of confidence at the time. Um, you know, there's a lot going on, but, you know, it definitely set up the process for me. And I've done that periodically. I mean, the Kickstarter, we had enough that we could fulfill an in integrity, but we still had a lot more to do. And, uh, you know, I tried to bridge the gap between expressing confidence in what we're doing and also honesty in the actual place we are. You know, that was kind of the dynamic that's uh, challenging from a crowdfunding standpoint, because we were a true crowdfund. We had an idea, we had a prototype, but we really didn't know. We weren't like Nikon cameras uses. We, we saw they had a cool product and, you know, they're on a, on Kickstarter. It's like, they don't need to do a Kickstarter. <laughs> they don't need yeah. a crowdfund. You know? Yeah, no, I love that. And actually, you just said something that like, I don't know, it's got to make its way to a t-shirt or something, which is stakes so high that you can't fail. I think that yeah. That mindset, 
you know, especially for young entrepreneurs and stuff like that. And like back to what has been sort of a, a resonating theme throughout this podcast, which is, you know, relationship with self and b- developing confidence and all these sorts of things, looking at life through the lens that you're creating stakes that are so high that you literally can't fail. You know, it, it almost takes away the the negative side, right? I mean, if you can't fail, then you're going to succeed. So it's like, yeah. you know, but so it's really, a, it's a mindset thing. But I think that that concept, you know, I think it eludes a lot of people. But I think that if you can get yourself into that mindset where, you know, you consider the, you know, basically, you know, back to our metaphor about growth, like, I mean, it's just, it's going to pull you, you know, to it. And, and, you know, maybe some people don't, maybe, the, you know, maybe they, they set stakes so high that they do fail, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but uh-huh. the, that will often be the people who are just talking anyway, they're, you know, they're not the ones. Well, yeah. And, 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 and it's also a calibration process, you know, I mean, discovery wasn't the first time that I tried to throw something out there, you know, and, and I mean, that was, that was the first time I tried to throw like something out into the reality TV realm, but I'd done other things. I told other people, Hey, I'm going to do this. And, you know, one time I was going to go to law school, I told some people I'm going to go to law school. And then I started studying for the LSAT and it was miserable. And then I realized like, I don't want to sit in an office and do this. That sucks. So well, I had to give it. And I don't, that wasn't a failure, but you know, I had publicly declared, and then I hadn't gone there. And, you know, I have plenty of those examples as well. Um, the discovery example is probably the most startling of like putting myself out there in such a big way and then bridging the gap. And, and that process is a calibration. Like you learn, you, you learn what you can do, what you can't do, what kind of is in your control and what, what isn't. And um, I've become better, I think, at publicly declaring things that I think I can actually do and, and more hesitant about the things that I, I'm maybe not fully committed to or aren't valuable to me. And, um, and it's mucky. That's the thing that sucks. You know, it's mucky figuring out that calibration, the ready aim or the ready fire aim approach isn't for everybody. A lot of people, you know, they need a, you know, they need their, their day job. They're not willing to take some of the risks that I've taken and, um, but they also have, you know, different strengths that they can bring to the table. Sure. You know? So I'm, I'm definitely more risk, uh, comfortable than right. a lot of other Well, people. and, but back to your, your comments earlier, right? I mean, it doesn't always have to be starting a business or developing a new product, right? I mean, your baby step or your thing that you might set stakes for is a weight loss goal or is a, you know, yeah. a, um, I don't know, somebody, you know, you want to run a marathon or something like that. And, you know, right now I, I don't get off the couch often enough to run a marathon. So that's a big goal, right? There's a big gap for me to fill, yeah. but you know, by doing so it's, you're accomplishing the same thing emotionally and mentally that you do if you succeed with your product or whatever, right? It's just growth. It's all about growth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amen. It all happens the same way. You use a lot of the same muscles too. So, um, it, I remember watching the, the first episode of, uh, of Baron C gold. And it literally opens with you in your office, closing the door for the last time and walking out and like, here we go. I'm going to be a gold miner. And just watching yeah. the, the, the evolution of, you know, Slucy 1.0 to your current dredge. Um, I mean, it's a big, big change and, and it's just a testament to, you know, the, the drive of I'm going to do this, I'm going to make it work and then, you know, solve each problem along the way. I mean, while we were there, uh, your pump motor blew up and watching you fix it and like all the steps you had to do to source a new motor, go see him, go do this, go, uh, you know, all crap. Now the fitting doesn't work. Let's take it off and do it again. It's like, it's, I think it's just part of the process of running a business. I mean, any business, anything that you do, any endeavor that you would take, you're going to have hurdles along the way. You're going to have like a good example of, you know, not to the extent of I'm on discovery and 6 million people are watching me fumble through this. Two years ago, I started a landscaping business. I said on here, I'm going to start a landscaping business. And sure enough, I did it. I did three or four small projects, but after the first summer of doing it, I realized I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I don't have, there's no joy in this for me. I, I enjoy doing my own projects, but getting told by someone fix that, do this, do that, not my cup of tea. And I realized that by doing it. And just, just because you say you're going to do something, it doesn't necessarily work out the way you intended. It's not a bad thing. 
So what? Start over. I started on that. Go find something else and do another project. Make it work. You know, find the one that's going to work for you. Find the center cam. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it's just a matter of your outlook and your you know, why you're doing it in the first place. The for me, that landscaping endeavor that helped pay my bills during COVID when I lost all my gigs and it served a point and a purpose. And yeah, it sucked. I didn't want to do it, but it's. It, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I got what I needed done. I was able to, you know, get through that hard stretch. And, and now I, I don't want to do landscaping anymore and there's nothing wrong with that. So <laughs> uh, I just, I just, you know, there's, yeah, you, you might say you want to do something and if it doesn't come out the way that it's in your head or, or work the first time, there's, there, there's no shame in that. It, yeah. It just, you know yeah yeah i mean and that's that goes to the like the recalibration you know there there's certain things like <clears throat> i was doing the same thing i mean just to, i was in between businesses i was totally broke and i had a skill set that paid decent money so i started doing repair work and like at that point i had an mba and i'm like fixing toilets and i'm you know i was leveling houses I was confronted with that <laughs> every day like what yeah. am i doing like i have so many skills to offer and i'm just I'm underutilized right now. And that was the biggest thing that was a driving factor for me. And, and I had a lot of emotional stuff going on in the background. Like I put a quote on my wall that said, screw your feelings. Act. <laughs> it didn't say screw. It said a different word, but for your listenership, <laughs> but the idea was like, I had to confront a lot of my negative psychology directly. It was a battle. It was a war it was very difficult. And I had to overcome a lot of that static of like, just that self doubt and that negative self talk and stuff. And, and what I found as I was in some uh, difficult emotional places is that one of the, one of the big things that helps is if you just start moving, you start doing something just because it's easy, especially if you have an office based job, just to kind of get sucked in your computer, but move your body, go have a conversation with somebody that knows about what you want to do whether that like to your point, Ryan, whether that's weight loss or whether that's relationships or whatever, I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be business related, but go and talk to somebody that knows a little bit more than you do about something. Just move your body, talk. And most of us don't go into a talking relate, like a, a social engagement saying, I'm so depressed. I'm so, uh, you know, we don't go into that. Like we, we put ourselves together at least enough for someone to actually meet us someplace. And so that very act of movement of actually prepping to be with somebody. Like I knew that about myself. I'm not going to bring people down. I don't want to do that. So even if I'm in a bad state inside, I'm not going to portray that to other people. But the, the, the cool thing about that is as you put yourself around other people, all of a sudden you have a little bit of better energy. And I just started doing that when I was in a bad place. And um, I, I, I realized like there's some magic that happens when you just start moving your body. And so I just started doing that more often. It's, I constantly have to do that. I have a never ending to-do list up here. The work is never going to be finished up here in Nome and it's overwhelming. So, you know, you just have to do what you can. And then you have to go to this Zen place of like, okay, now it's done. I'm not going to do any more today. Like, and it's okay. And um, to your point, Mike, it, uh, yeah. When I look back at Slucy, like I want to pat like my first dredge, my first gold diving boat, I wanted to kind of pat that little Ian on the head and say, Oh, you know, <laughs> good try Like, like where the boat is now, what it can do, how it's doing it. You know, it's a whole other world, but you have to start somewhere. And that's what I mean by the ready fire aim approach. You, you know, you put your rifle up, you shoot, and then you see where it went. And then and you you're adjust. like, Oh, it went to the right. Okay. Now I can go back to the left shoot. Oh, okay. It's different than, you know, having a rifle that's sighted in that, you know, like when you actually shoot, you're going to hit your target. It's different. It doesn't, doesn't happen like that. Well, but a lot and, of people, you know, especially when it's public, it's really hard to like shoot that shot in front of a bunch of people when you're just starting. It's hard. Well, it, that first shot too. I mean, that rifle sighted in because someone took the, the shots necessary to sight yeah. it in. So yeah. if you, if you don't, try it to take that first shot the sights are always going to be off and once you do it enough it's easier to to 
dial in a scope for the next time, you know, the next gun you get or whatever. It, it's, it's just a metaphor, but um, it, it once you do it enough times, it's easier to kind of get systems in place and figure out what you need to do for the next project or this or that. Yeah. Um, I like the point kind- you made real quick. Hang on just one sec, Mike. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I like the point that you make about, you know, when you go get out in front of other people, you know, you do sort of puff yourself up, right? Like even if you're going to a job interview or maybe you're just networking, right? We have this natural inclination not to try and drag people down, right? We want to try and and either represent ourselves as best as we can, which is where you get those guys who are talkers, and, you know, or we're we're out there trying to, you know, at least pull ourselves together. You know, even if, if things are, are bad at home or whatever, we're always willing to puff ourselves up. But what I think is interesting about that is that it's almost a metaphor or a recurring theme for you that you were doing this, you know, puff yourself up, rise yourself up kind of thing throughout your career. And now you're trying to do it digitally. And so and basically you're doing the same thing. You're allowing people to be able to puff themselves up and look better and present themselves better via this technology. And, uh, and so I think it's kind of interesting, you know, just looking at these sort of past parallels to what's going on presently and how that sort of ethic, I guess, has sort of gone throughout. So <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a cool story. Well, so, I think you have a good future in therapy too. That was some good <laughs> shit right there. <laughs> All right. Well, I think what Mike was starting to say is that we're getting to the end of the show and uh, you know, obviously we could go on for some time. There's a, a lot of ground we haven't covered yet, but um, I wonder if you could maybe just let people know where they can learn more about the product. If they want to engage with you personally, maybe there's a place they can find you online uh, and any other parting shots you might have. Yeah. Uh, the centercam.com. Uh, is our website. So you're welcome to go there, check out our products. Um, we've got a YouTube channel, so it's just the center cam. Also, um, we have some stuff there. We have an active Instagram handle, which is also, I think that's just center cam um, on Instagram. And then my personal Instagram is uh, the real Ian Foster. <laughs> and uh, there's all, there's a bunch of Ian Fosters. I started a face group, Facebook group called the real Ian Foster years ago. Cause I, I Google when I was in discovery, I was like, well, what's up there. So I typed in Ian Foster and there were like 50 Ian Fosters that came up. So I friended all of them. And then there's like this little mini Facebook group called the real Ian Foster. So that's kind of a <laughs> joke about that. But um, anyway, um, yeah, those are the ways you can reach out. I actually, I had one more question and I was going to tie it into the, the parting shots, but I, I was curious, is your dredge out? Do you have it uh, functioning or is center cam kind of the priority right now? So center cam, center cam and uh, finishing the house. Those are priorities in Nome this summer. So my dredge has actually been parked right in front of my house. I have to walk around it every time I go to the (laughs) shop or get supplies. And I've had like maybe five more hours of work to do to put it back together. And I've been focused on other stuff. I will get wet this summer, though. I promise. I promise. You're good. Yeah. I can't let it, I can't let other stuff. You know, priorities change. But I love gold diving, man. That's why I'm up here. You know, I, I love the community up here. Say hi to everyone for me. And, I will. Um, yeah, thank you for making time for this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, Ian. This has been awesome. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. See you guys next time.